Good evening, everyone. We're holding by Perik We finished last week, we finished Perik Zayn. So we're holding now by Perik which is on page Tzadik Ches, opposite of page 194. And today in Mir Hashem, we are going to finish the topic of Tshuva Tata. The first half of Perik Ches ends. The first part of Perik Ches concludes the concept of, of Tshuva Tata. And then the last half of it begins Tshuva Ila, a conversation which continues already into Perik Tess, the higher level of Tshuva. Today, Mr. Hashem, we will conclude the lower level of Tshuva. So at least when Chedesh Elul comes, when is your Chedesh? Thursday. Thursday. So when it comes upon us, at least, um, at least we'll know step one. Step one of Tshuva, Tshuva Tata. So we already know from the previous prakim, we know what shuva is. A resolve never to do an avera again. That is the essence of what shuva is. We know why we are doing shuva because our neshamas and the hey tata, the lower hey of Hashem's name, have been dragged down into klipis and have been damaged and hurt by our averas. So we know why we're doing shuva. And in Patriarch Zion, we also learned how we do tshuva. So we completed the picture. We had the what is tshuva, that was first, then why we do tshuva, that was second, and Patriarch Zion, we finished off with the how we do tshuva, and the how we do tshuva is, there's two elements to tshuva. As Dr. Rebbe explains, contemplating the great Rachmanis it is on our neshama, and the great Rachmanis it is on Hashem, as a result of our Averis, that's um, idea number one. Idea number two is to have a leiv nishpar, to have a broken heart, through also through contemplating what we have wrought through our Averis. And that leads us directly into Perichas. Perichas v'hinei. Achrei ha-makas hadas b'chol hanal. After thinking deeply into all of the above. Just want to point out, thinking deeply. Contemplating. I think if, if there's one um, capacity, capability that has been completely shot by our age of, of instant everything and uh, the screen time and the constant um, disturbance and interruptions of the different uh, forms of technology that we have available to us is the ability to take time just to think, to take time, uninterrupted time, and to be misboinen. This is something that we've talked about many times, and this, this is at the core of what Chabad is. Chabad is Chachma, Bina, and Das. So Chachma is the flash of inspiration that a person has, whether that comes from deep inside the person, whether that is sourced uh, uh, outside, in other words, it comes from the outside, and then Bina, is the mental processing, but the mental processing in order to be able to fully understand that which we've experienced or that which we've been exposed to. That's what Bina is. Chachma, we have Bina also. We use our mind to figure out the things that we want to figure out, but the Das element, which means to take time to think about something and to connect to it, to process it and to let it digest intellectually digest, emotionally digest. That's something which today in the age of Twitter and everything has to come in 240 characters and um, where our attention span has been so reduced which we have a difficult time doing. Dr. Rebbe is telling us over here that if you want to do tshuva, and we're talking here about tshuva tata, we're talking about the lower level of tshuva, we're not even talking yet about the tshuva ilah, but if you want to do tshuva Step number one is, you know, tell me what to do. What do I have to do? It's not about what you have to do. It's a state of mind. It's a state of being. It's a having a broken heart. It's an awareness. And that takes time. It takes time of sitting with yourself and allowing the reality to sink in. And I think most of us would rather do something for 10 hours than sit and think for five minutes. <laughs> I think that's true for, for many of us. Sasan, is that correct what I'm saying? 100%. Yeah, it's painful to have to sit by a table and after two minutes you're looking at your watch and you're looking at your phone and you're looking at this and at that. 
But the Alter Rebbe says, if you, want to do, if you want to do tshuva, in other words, we ask ourselves, why is it? I decide that I'm not going to do an Ayavera again, and three minutes later I did it. You know why? Because your whole process of tshuva lasted two seconds. So a two-second tshuva is going to last for three minutes. <laughs> if you want to do real tshuva, the Alter Rebbe says, Achri hamakas hadas b'chohanal. Hamakas hadas means to take the time to think deeply. And obviously now the month of Elul is upon us. The Shabbos is already Shabbos Mavarcham Chaydish Elul. And we're already beginning to feel the, the Elul winds in the ear. I'm not talking about the physical temperature, but I'm talking about the Elul is approaching and the new year is approaching. And hopefully, as they say, Tich Lashano Klali Seha, that this year and all its curses will, uh, will be relegated to history and we'll start a new, a new year with new brachas. But we also have to prepare ourselves, every single one of us, for the new year. For that, we have a month of Elul, a month of preparation, a month of Tshuva. And we have to realize that Elul is not only a time when we do more mitzvahs and we learn more Torah, which obviously that is true also, but it's a time also for Hamaka Sadas. We really have to um, take Perik Zayin, the Perik which we just learned, where it talks about what we've done when we've done Navera. And having Rachmanas and Hashem, Rachmanas and Hashem. And having a leiv nishpar, and we have to sit with it, and that is the path to tshuva. There is no, there is no, uh, there is no substitute for that. There is no substitute for that, taking the time, and and and, and contemplating yourself, your relationship with Hashem, your averus, etc. Doesn't say in Chodesh Elul, "Kol Omer Echtav Hashem Echtav Hashem." And it's not about Elul. That's in general, but that's, I'm not sure how that relates to our conversation. No one here is saying Echtav No, he's saying you have to go deep for the tour, according to the... Right. So how you go deep if you said, okay, I'm going to make a vera, I'm going to make tshuva, I'm going to, uh, again a vera. So it's not deep. Well, if that's what you're doing, it's not deep. If you go deep, that's not going to happen. If they go deep and take the time to think and uh, really process these ideas that we're talking about. Yeah. But after a person does that and takes the time, and talk is ma'ira the rachmim, ma'ira the rachmim of himself, and ma'ira also for the rebbeinu shalaylam, and also, as mentioned, um, has a leave nishbar. So after that, yuchal levakish be'emes. Then a person can turn to Hashem and ask with an emes meumka deliba. Depth. From the depths of the heart. With your abundant mercy, please erase my Averis. And you feel it. It's not Stam you're asking, Vigoimer. You know, you feel it. And one of the one of the alchets that we say is Alchet Shachatanul Fanacha Bevidui Pech. What does it mean, Alchet Shachatanul Fanacha Bevidui Pech? The Avera that we did with Vidui, Vidui is a mitzvah. How's that an Avera? The Svadu is Chataza. So pshat is that we turn to Hashem and we say that we're sorry and we're asking forgiveness for all the times when we said vidui and we were insincere about it. We said vidui, but it wasn't real. And every time that I'm saying it, I'm thinking to myself, am I transgressing this very thing as I'm saying it? <laughs> as I'm saying, as I'm asking for forgiveness for insincere vidui, is this, is this vidui insincere also? So a lot of times we turn to Hashem and we say, Please, please have Rachmim and erase my Avedis. But we don't feel the Rachmim, we don't feel the Rachmanis, we don't feel the Avedis. It's not that an Emes, but after, if a person has taken the time take it, to process everything that is said in Perik Zayin, then the person can take it, say, umka deliba, from the depths of the heart. You can turn to Hashem and say, Hashem, please take it. I, I feel the pain and please do me a favor. And erase my averus. Ki azai, because then, tikava beliba, it'll be installed in your heart. Be'emes. Goydla rachmanus. You'll talk if feel the incredible rachmanus. Al bechinus al akusha benavshe. On the godliness which is in your nefesh and your neshama. Ushalamayla and the rachmanus also on Hashem above. Keniskar le'il, as mentioned earlier. And what do you accomplish? Up until now we talked about what the person has done. Now we're going to talk about the effect and the impact when you talk and do tshuva as the way the Alter Rebbe tells you to do tshuva. What happens above? With this, you will awaken the rachmim hel yoinim, the thirteen midas rachmim, 
Hanem Shachos Meratzon Ha'Elyon Baruchu, the Rachmim, which they come directly from Hashem's Ratzon, Hanirmaz Bekoitzei Shel Yud, the Ratzon which is alluded to in the um, the Koitzei Shel Yud, the yeah, that line that extends right over the Yud. Which is well above and beyond the actual godliness which is drawn down and comes in the oasis, in the letters of the Yudke Vavke. Now, for those of you who remember, and I'm sure some of you over here have Pashat not slept for a few months, because when we learned, um, when we learned the Geras HaTshuva Perik Dalet, so the Alter Rebbe talks about over there, the four letters of Hashem's name. and talks about the Yud is Chachma and the He is Bina. I'm talking about on page 188. And the Vav are the Midas, and the He is Malchus. And if you look five lines from the top of page 188, Alter Rebbe makes a little interruption and says, Va'koit Sha'ala Yud, that the line which extends above the Yud, Reimiz L'Bechines Ratzna Elyin Baruchu. So that alludes to Hashem's Ratzin. Shalamay Lamay Lamadregis Bechines Chachmi Yilah Kenoida which is above and beyond the level of Chachmah. So at that point, in this year, we asked, why is Dr. Rebbe telling us this? The whole point of that period was Dr. Rebbe was drawing, drawing the parallel that just like Hashem's energy is configured in the four letters of the Yud Kei Vav Kei, the same thing is also Arne Shamas are also, we have also the Yud Kei Vav, Vav Kei within us because Chelek Hashem Amoy. So why is the fact that there is a line on the top of the Yud, which uh, alludes to the to, to Hashem's Ratzon, which is higher than the Ten Spheres, why is that relevant? So at that time we said, as Sasson, I'm sure you remember, that when we get to Peter Ches, we'll answer that question. So we're here at Peter Ches. So now we, have, now, now we have an answer to that question. And the answer is because this Koitz is going to play a very pivotal role in Shuvah. Because tshuva comes from the Yud Gimel Midas Harachmim, which are sourced in Hashem's Ratzin, which is higher than the Yud Kei Vavke, which is higher than, higher than the Sphiris. And if I pull you back also, Tiger Satshuva Perik Aleph, the very first page, on page 180. So if you remember over there, it says, if you look, 12 lines from the bottom. It talks about someone who was over in a mitzvah It says there lakach ein kapara lenafshe. The person can't. Uh, there is no kapara, which means you don't. You can't clean up the mess you made in your nefesh. Velay lamayla. You also you can't clean up the mess you made above. Ad yemekipurim. Remember we said over there that mitzvah sasei you're for you're forgiven and the mess is cleaned right away. But for a lisasa, we brought down from the gemara and yuma. For that you have to wait until yom kippur. Why yom kippur? Meshach Kosov, as the Pasuk says, that what happens on Yom Kippur, v'chipper ala kodesh, that we clean up all that is holy. What does that mean on Yom Kippur? We clean up what is holy. Our neshamas are holy. The hey tata, all that we, all that we, all that we made uh, muddy and filthy and soiled all over the year, all the holy stuff that we, um, that we messed with, so we clean that up on Yom Kippur. Mitumah is b'nei Yisrael. From all the impurities that you know that we caused, from the Averis of Gemer, and the pasuk continues, "Lifnei Hashem Titaru." Before Hashem, and Yom Kippur, before Hashem, you will become pure. And Alter Rebbe says, "Lifnei Hashem Daika." These words are very, very particular. What does it mean, "Lifnei Hashem"? So, the regular reading of the pasuk is "Lifnei Hashem," that when I stand before Hashem, I am pure. But on a deeper level, Lefnei Hashem Titaru means that where does purity come from? Where does Tara come from? Where does the Kapara come from? Lefnei Hashem, before Hashem, higher than Hashem. What's higher than Hashem? Higher than Yudke Vavke? Higher than Yudke Vavke is the Kreitz Yishal Yud. Is that, is that line that extends above the Yud? Which means that it's higher. Lefnei, higher than Yudke Vavke, which is the Ratzan of Hashem, which from over there comes the Yud Gimel Midas Arachna. There's a whole system of divine energies, a whole system of energies that come from Hashem. And these systems are configured Chachma, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gvura, Teferes, Natsach, Hoyd, Yisoyed, Malchus, right? That's the way that Hashem's energy enters creation. 
But there is Hashem as He is before He enters the system. And that is Hashem's Ratzin. Because Ratzin is synonymous with who we are. I want something. When I want something, the word, the word Ratzin means, is related to the word Ratz, which means to run. When I want something, that means I am drawn towards something. Ratzin is very, very deep in the nefesh. Very, very deep. It is, it's an expression of the nefesh. And that's why we know that our Ratzin dominates everything. You know, we have a whole system, and se- Seichel impacts Midas, and Midas impact Machshav Diber Maisa, and also works vice versa. Machshav Diber Maisa impact Midas, and Midas impact Seichel, and everything. There is this reciprocal impact of everything. And then there's the king, which is Ratzin. And by the way, that's why in Kabbalah, Ratzin is known as Keser, which is the crown. Because your Ratzin is the king. So let's say you want to understand something. You want to learn a safer. Very difficult. If you have a ratzain, ain davar emif ne ratzain, your ratzain, your your will will force your mind to understand it. If you have a deep enough desire and ratzain for it, you'll understand it. If you want to like something, you'll like something. You want to do something, you'll do it. You want to say it, you'll say it. It's the king. Why is that? Because it is the deepest part of who you are. What I want. And the same thing is, when it comes to Hashem, there's Hashem's Ratzin. Now, what is Hashem's Ratzin? Ordinarily, Hashem wants us to learn Torah and to do mitzvahs. But if you actually reach the place of Hashem's Ratzin, the same, the same, the same Hashem who desires Torah and mitzvahs, He's not Himself restricted by that desire. In other words, he's the Baal HaRatzin. He's the one who has that desire. He can change his desire. And he could look at you and say, Hello, you did shriva? So I desire to forgive you. Yesterday I wanted you to learn Torah and Mitzvah. And I didn't want you to do Averis. And by the way, I really, really wanted that. I did not want you to do an Avera. And when you did an Avera, I was upset. But because you did shriva, so because Ratzin is beyond the system and controls the system, when we tap into that place of Hashem, to the Kreutzer Shal Yud, Lifnei Hashem Titaru. So yes, we might have made Pegamim as we learned in the la- end of last period, right? We damaged the Yud of Hashem's name and the He of Hashem's name and the Vav of Hashem's name and the last day of Hashem's name, which is why by Krishna at night we say, when I, if I damage the Yud, I get skill. If I damage the He, I get uh, Shrefar. We Remember, we learned that over the last uh, two classes. But when you reach higher than Yud Kei Vav Kei, so suddenly you reach the place where over there, there are no more rules. And everything can get fixed. Hashem's Ratzon over there. Hashem says, yeah, this is what I want. I want to accept your tshuva. That's why Yud Gimel Midas Harachmim are rooted in Dafke in the Ratzon. Because where does Hashem's Rachmim come from? What is Hashem's Rachmim? Hashem's Rachmim is, you did bad things, you did Averis all your life. And according to the system, which you completely messed up everything in the system, and you made pegamim, you, made, you damaged everything everywhere, right now you're, you're a lost case. But mitzad the ratzen of Hashem, from where it comes, you'd give him mitzad rachem, Hashem can turn around and say, salachti kidvarecha. Yeah? So it's two, there, there's two levels, ratzen and al ratzen? Yeah, yeah. But, I, but I don't want to go there. But yes, there is. We need to get the bal ratzen, yeah. Which is what Shuvah does. In Chassidus, in many places, is brought down an interesting Talmud Yerushalmi. It's also brought down in different Midrash and brought down in Yalkut Shemaini. Maybe we even mentioned this once in class. It says, Sha'alu l'chachma. They, they asked Chachma. Who is they? I don't know. Klal Yisrael, the Nevi'im, whatever. Chachma was asked. Nefesh ki sechta. A nefesh ayid who does an avera. What happens with such a yid? What's the din? So Chachma responded, Your evil will pursue you. It's a pasuk. We had it in the, in the Haftarah recently. Your evil will pursue you. Your evil will pursue you and chase you. And, uh, it's a pasuk in Yeshaya, if I remember correctly. 
So the Yidin weren't very satisfied with this answer. So Shaalu Lenevua, they went and they asked prophecy. The same question. Nefesh Kisechta, a person who does an Avera, what's the verdict? What will be with such a person? Nevua answered, Hanefesh Achitas Hitamus, a person who does an Avera has to die. Now that answer definitely wasn't what they were looking to hear. <laughs> so they went on, they went up the chain. Shalu the Taira. They went and asked Taira the same question. A person does an Avera, what should be? And Taira answered, Yavi Asham Vyiskaparle. The person should bring a carbon and he will be forgiven. And the Eden still weren't happy with that answer. So Shalu la Kadash Baruchu. They went and asked Hashem himself. A person does an Aveda, what should he with the person? And Hashem answered, Yase tshuva, let the person do tshuva, and everything will be fine. So Chesidus explained that every single, the, the, the question was answered on each level, on the truth of that level. When you go to Chachma, when you go to wisdom, and you, tell, you, ask, you ask wisdom or a wise person, I did bad stuff, what's the consequence of that? He's not going to tell you, oh, you're going to go and burn in Gehenna. When you do bad things, there are consequences to it. Natural consequences. You hurt yourself, you hurt the people around you, and that damage that you caused yourself, that damage you caused to your relationships, ultimately they come around and they bite you. You're a product of your behavior. You don't need to have an external consequence. Now imagine you go to a, to, to a wise person and said, um, I did some awful things in my marriage. What's my punishment? He says, what's your punishment? The natural consequence of what you've done is your punishment. Whatever it is you did, the consequence of that is your punishment. I don't have to be put in jail. A yid does an avera, so, and has damaged himself, has damaged his relationship with, with, with Hashem, so, ti asrecha That which you did bad, that itself will pursue you and will come back to bite you. So then the Yidin went further and they went and they asked the question by Nevoah. Now what is Nevoah? Nevoah means communication with Hashem. The only way you become a, bottle, uh, become a Navi is when you're completely bottled with Hashem, when you have no ego. Because if you have an ego, then you have no place. There's no place for, for Hashras, Hashkina. That's why you have to be happy. You know, it says, Eina, Eina, Nevoah, Shere, Elamotech, Simcha. Because happy people are humble people. Arrogant people are depressed people. They're too busy thinking about themselves all the time. So the idea, Nevuah is communication with Hashem, connection to Hashem. So you go to, they went to Nevuah and said, a person does an Avera, Nevuah is an Avera. If there, is no, if there is no connection to Hashem, because an Avera severs one's connection with Hashem, so if the connection to Hashem has been severed, so you die. What's, what's there to live for anymore? So Nevoah is even more drastic than Chachma. Chachma says, you did an Avera, it's a bad thing. Now if you do a bad thing, there's always the consequences of the bad thing. Nevoah, which the whole idea of Nevoah is connection to Hashem. Nevoah says, you did an Avera, there's no more life. V'atam advekim b'ashem alikeichem, chayim kulchem hayoyim. Right, you're not dovik in Hashem anymore, you did an Avera. So the only, the only, only option remaining is death. So the Yidin went to Teira. Teira was able to find a mechanism to be able that a person should be forgiven by bringing a carbon. But ultimately, even that is a mechanism. We have to find something that counteracts the Avera. We have to find some sort of tool, some sort of dynamic which you can employ, which will somehow neutralize the negative impact of what you've done. Okay, Teira says, I found it. Within the system of Teira mitzvahs, I found for you something which will clean away your Avera. Now even though this seems to be pretty cool, did an Avera, and all I have to do is take a cow, take a sheep, shecht it, and you're good. The Yidin weren't happy. And they went to Hashem. And Hashem says, you do tshuva, and you don't have to worry about the system. Because tshuva is a short circuit. When you do tshuva, you reach me as I am above the system, and everything gets taken care of automatically because I am the source of the system. And just like I decided I wanted a system, I also can decide whenever I want that an individual person, I will re-accept that person regardless of what the rules of the system may be. 
And that is what Shuvah is all about. The Kaitz Yishal Yud. V'lachainan, therefore, ten lines from the top of Perichas. V'lachainan, therefore, ha-yud gimel mida sarachmim, the yud gimel mida sarachmim, minakim kolap gamim, they clean up all the blemishes. Anything that, any issues or problems that there are with the system, they get cleaned up. It's basically, you're bringing in a completely new level of energy into the system, which takes care of everything. As the Pasuk says, when, when we talk about the, the Pasuk that describes the Yudgim Amid Sarachim, it says, Noisei, Avain, Vafesha, the Abishter forgives, Avain, Vafesha, Venake, and he cleans up. New Ruven, question? Excuse me. What? It said, Venake, Loyenake. When we say Yudgim Amid we don't say Loyenake. Oh, what's what? Noisi Avain, Vafasha, Venake. Venake, yeah. Oh, they say Avain. Sorry? Vichatoa. I'll try to skip out a word over here. Chatoa? Yeah. I didn't know. He left it out. Yeah? He quoted it. I didn't know that. You pushed it. You wanted to give him the opportunity. Noisi Avain, Vafasha, Venake. What happened to Vichatoa? What's the difference between Chato and Pesha? What's the difference between Chato and Pesha? So a chait is a veri that you did b'shegig. Pesha? Pesha is an aveira you do b'mezid. A aveira and a Pesha, they're two different types of averas that you do b'mezid. One is worse than the other, but they're both b'mezid. So the Rebbe explains that for v'chato, for the aveira that you do b'shegig, you don't need to give him the sharachim for that. In other words, even within the system, that could be fixed. But when you do an aveira, the avin, the Pesha, the Avedis that you did bemaze it on purpose? For that, you need to give me the Sarah. New Ruven question. So, why is Vachato included and you give me the Sarah? <laughs> why did Altarebbe decide to edit the Pasuk? It does appear in the Pasuk over there, right? So, the Rebbe explains that what Taka, based on what, uh, what Sasson said, what are the next words? Venake la Yenake. What does Venake la Yenake mean? Venake means that the Abishter will clean up. What is v- but what is Vala Yenake? The Mason. No, so the uh, Rashi, Venake, the Abishter will clean, will, will clean up, will, will clear those who do Tshuva. But Vala Yenake, the Abishter, is not Menake. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't vindicate and clean up those who don't do Tshuva. Vichato, so you have to add a Vichato. So you should know that if you do an Averi, even if it's Bishagig, if you don't do Tshuva, you have to do tshuva even for an Aveiri, which is a Bishagig. But at the end of the day, for the purposes of our conversation over here, which is that when you do tshuva, it is necessary to draw upon you give me the Sarachmim in order to clean up the mess, that doesn't include Vechata. In other words, for a Aveiri Bishagig, you do tshuva, and even if it weren't for the Yud Gimel Midas Sarachmim, even if you're only working within the system, you could say, I did it by mistake, so therefore you'd be forgiven and you can clean up the mess. But for Avon Vapesha, for that, in order to have Venake, for that you need Yud Gimel Midas Arachim. So what you do is, again, when a person does Shuva properly, and when he turns to Hashem and says, Berik Rev Rachamecha Mechet Beshoi, so then you're evoking the Yud Gimel Midas Arachim. And what happens then? Vishuv, and from that point and on, Ein Yenika Lachitzoinim Vasiter Achra Mashpas Heitator Kenal. You cut off the valve, the valve that you opened up through the Averis, which allows divine energy to descend into the Klipis, the divine energy of the of the Heitator. You shut that. In other words, you clean up. You you made a blemish when you did an Avera. In other words, you made. It's like. Um, you know, the Pasuk says, V'noikev shem Hashem. V'noikev shem Hashem means someone who curses the name of Hashem. But what is the word V'noikev? The word V'noikev can also mean yeah, a hole. to make a hole. A hole, that could Right? So Chassidus has explained, V'noikev shem Hashem, that any time a person does an Avera, what they're really doing is, noikev shem Hashem, you're making a hole in the name of Hashem. It's like you're putting a hole in the balloon or in the... 
and which allows that hole allows the energies to seep, to seep out and go to the wrong place. But when you do tshuva, and when you bring down the earth, you give me the sharachim, you clean up all the pagam, you fix up all the damage you've done, you cover up the hole, and from here on, again, you cut off the lifeline to the clippers. And through that tashuv, hey, tatalim koimam. What you do is you've restored the hay, the lower hay to its place. Which is, as we mentioned, Shuvah Tata. Shuvah Tata means that you, by doing an Avera, you dragged the lower hay of Hashem's name into Klippa and disconnected it from where it, uh, from, from its place, its rightful place in Atsilus. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so through Shuvah, we restore the hay Tata. L'syache, the now the hay Tata is free to once again reunite the Yud K Vav. And the first three letters of Hashem's name, the Yud, the Hey, and the Vav, the Dayla Maven. The Chain, Mamesh Lamata, Benefesh, Adam, the same thing is also. Down here, the Nefesh, Elokish, Avayid, so that's what you caused above when you do Juva. So the first thing is you cause the fixing of all the damage you did above, and therefore closing up the channels of energy to the Klippus. The same thing down here, the Nefesh, Elokish, Adam, the Nefesh, Elokish, the person. Shuv ena v'nesech mavdilim. The averus that separated you from Hashem are no longer separate you from Hashem. But Kumei Shikatsu was the pasuk says, "Venake that he cleans up. Menake who lashavim the avish that cleans up for all those who do tshuva. Lirchayis v'lenake snafsham to rinse and to clean off their souls. Melavushim hatsoyim from the soiled garments, which are heimach yitsoyim v'sitra achra." Which those are the klipos to the achra kumeshakasa the gemara as the gemara says masech the seitem malafafte v'chulu the gemara says that if a person does an avera so that avera malafafte malafafte means um, it, it covers you it coddles you you know like um, it swaddles you you know like a baby you swaddled when a person says the gemara says there when a person does an avera malafafte the avera it swaddles you and when you go up to heaven it's it, it's uh, it's stuck to you. But when a person does tshuva, so then it cleans it off and there is no more relation left from the Avera. Once the person has gotten rid of the Avera and its impact, so now you're ready to do a higher level of tshuva, which is tshuva ilah. There's a story which the Rebbe quoted many times, that the, at one time in the day after Yom Kippur, so the Rebbe Rayatz, the previous Rebbe, the Rebbe's father-in-law, he went into his father, the Rebbe Rashab, Rabbi Shalom Ber, and said, okay, so what now? You know, even Kippur is finished, so what now? And the Rebbe Rashab answered, each midaf ersh chuvatan. Now we, will, now, we get, now we can start doing chuva. <laughs> In other words, when you conclude one level of chuva, now we start doing chuva on a much higher level. And that's really what we have here. Till now we talked about chuva tata. And from here on, the Rebbe is going to say, now that you fixed up all the problems, now there's a whole new level of tshuva which goes beyond the damage that you have done. And in a nutshell, that is returning the lower level of tshuva. Tshuva tata is by neshama came down over here into this world, and it was pure tohiri. Okay, neshama shnesata be tohiri, right? And then through my averus, I, I soiled my neshama. So the lowest level of tshuva is getting my neshama back to the place where it was before I did the Avera. A higher level of tshuva is my neshama came down here into my body even before I did an Avera. That was an incredible yurida for my neshama from the way it was before I came down. The higher level of tshuva is I need to restore my neshama to the way it was, tashuv. Restore my neshama to the way it was before it even came down here into the guf. And that we will talk about in Mir Hashem as we continue. So it's like all our life we balet tshuva. Sorry. All our life, we have to start to be a tshuva, more tshuva. We'll get to that soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Bashkoch Pratis, we're learning here about Yud Gil and Midasarachim, and as I mentioned, we are about to enter Shabbos Mavar Chedesh Elul, Shabbos Parshas Re'e this week, which is always either Shabbos Mavar Elul or Rish Chedesh Elul. It's one of the two. So, this Shabbos already has a very strong connection, a very uh, strong connection to Elul. And there's a very famous Maimer from the Alter Rebbe about the month of El. The Maimer is Dibur HaMaschil. The Maimer begins with the words, Ani L'doidi V'doidi Li, which is Rosh Tevis of El. The Alter Rebbe says that if you look in the Sfarm of the Mukubalim, 
you find that what is so special about the month of El? What's so special about the month of El was that there's a gilu of Yud Gimel Midas and Achim during the month of El. Which is, by the way, you know, from, from, from Rosh Chodesh Elul until Yom Kippur, we have 40 days. And those were the 40 days when Moshe Rabbeinu was up on the mountain. And those were the, but those were the 40 days that were Berats, and those were the 40 days when Hashem already, His mercy was extended. Hashem already had told Moshe, to, uh, to uh, carve for himself two new luches, and Moshe went up, and it culminated with the, again, with the statement in Yom Kippur, Vayemer Hashem Shalachti Kedvarecha, the Yidin were completely forgiven. So these 40 days, starting with the uh, month of El, was already a time of the Gilui, of the Yud Gilui Midas Arach. So the Rebbe asked a question, he says, if there is such a high gilui during the month of El, of Yud Gilui Midas Arach, and based on what we learned right now, we understand just how high that gilui is. We're talking about a gilui which is completely above and beyond the system. So why is it that the month of Elul isn't a yomtiv the entire month? Instead, we have regular weekdays and we go to work and we do our thing. Now think about it for a second. A yomtiv, what is a yomtiv? To say that in a yomtiv there is gilui there's a revelation of Elokus would be, would be to say it wrong. It's not as if there's a yomtiv and Hashem says, oh, because it's a yomtiv, there will be a higher revelation. No. The definition of a yomtiv is that there's a, there's a revelation of Hashem more so than that, more so than in a normal day. That was brought down on Hanukkah. It says on Hanukkah, so the Gemara says, L'shona ha'acher kovum, that the next year they were, they, they, um, they established the eight days of Hanukkah. So why did they wait till the next year to establish it? Why didn't right away? When there's a miracle happened and the candles burned the eight days, they should establish the Yom Tov. So it's brought down in Sfarm al that The reason why is because a Yom Tov isn't a commemoration of an event that happened a long time ago. A Yom Tov means that there's a Gili Alukus, which appears every single year and that given time. In fact, which was the reason why the miracle happened in the first, way, in the first place anyways. So, when the miracle happened, they didn't know. They said, is it a Yom Tev? Is there going to be a Gili Elokus? I don't know. We have to wait till next year. Let's see what happens. Next year came along Chafei Kislev, and the Chachamim at that time were very high people and very holy people, and they saw that it's happening again. You know, Vayam HaMeila and his Karim Ben Asim was saying the Megillah that the days, we remember them, Ben Asim, they're actually happening again. In other words, the same spiritual energy is existent. So they made the Yom Tev of Hanukkah. So the Gedder of a Yom Tev, the definition of a Yom Tev is that there's a higher revelation of godliness, which is why there is a Yom Tev on that day. Now, when there's a higher revelation of godliness, so we're closer to Hashem, so then we don't work. Imagine if you're in the king's palace and you're standing in front of the king and you're cooking <clears throat> or you're plowing your field. I don't know how you're plowing your field in the king's palace, but you get the point. Or you're sewing yourself a, a garment. You can't do that. So Shabbos and Yom Tev, we're in the king's palace, meaning there's a, Hashem is much more present, Hashem is much more revealed. And every Shabbos, every Yom Tiv is a different sort of revelation because you know Hashem manifests Himself in many ways. So the, the different nature of the different Yom Tovim, they, uh, they hinge upon the different types of revelation from Hashem. And the greater the revelation is, the greater the Shabbos, the greater the Yom Tiv. And yet here we have a month in which we say there's the Gilu Yud Gimu Midas Nachman, and nevertheless the whole thing is weekdays. Can you imagine that? It should be a, it should be a month long Yom Tiv. Moreover, the Alter Rebbe continues and he asks, it's also brought down in the, in the, in this form of Kabbalah, and this we all know, that Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and the Saras Mitshuva are time of Gil Yud Gimel Mitzrachim. So what's the difference between the month of Elul and Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur? So the Alter Rebbe answers with a mashal, and this mashal, I could say, quite literally was repeated by the Rebbe tens and tens of times every year. Not, I'm not talking about uh, over the course of the Rebbe's leadership, every year. Sometimes the Rebbe would say the mashal completely and elaborate upon it, but even when the Rebbe, the Rebbe would just say two words, which was a reference to this mashal, and maybe some of you heard those words, Melach Basada, the king is in the field. 
In the month of Elul, Melech Basada, the king is in the field. What does that mean? So the gives a mashal. He says, ordinarily, when the king is in his palace, you want to get an audience with the king, you want to see the king, you want to speak to the king, good luck. <laughs> you have to be a person with, uh, from the Sarim, you have to be one of the ministers, you have to be a high government official, you have to be an important person. And even if you're an important person, you have to wait in line, you have to get an, you have to get an audience, and you have to prepare yourself. However, the, however, the Alter Rebbe says, when the king is on his way back into the city, he traveled off, and he's coming back into the city, and as he passes through the fields on the way to the, to the, to the royal city, to the capital, as he passes through the field, so then, Rashoim, V'yechoyim, every single person has the opportunity to go over to the king and ask the king what he wants, and the king is Mekabel Kulam B'Sever upon him, Yafas, upon him, is the king, receives everyone with a smiling face and pleasantly and then the king goes back to the city, goes back to his palace and then once again you have to be an important person in order to go back into the king. al Rebbe says that's the marshal of Yerosa. In the month of El, the Malach is Basada, the king is in the field and anyone has the opportunity to approach the king. Rosh Hashanah Yim Kippur, the king is in the palace and that's why it's Yom Tif. And then, if you didn't prepare yourself properly during the month of El, so if you're still a behemoth, if you didn't do tshuva yet, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, you're going to have a tough time getting an audience with the king, because the king is in his palace. Vahashem, what do we say? And, and the Haftar Rosh Hashanah, Vahashem beheich al kachay, has mi pon of kola aretz. That Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, Hashem is beheich al kachay. Hashem is in his palace. But on the way to the palace during the month of El, the king is out in the field. And what's interesting is that when the king comes out to the field, He's very unimposing because he's coming out to the territory of the people. So when he's in the palace, you stand in front of the king, you're trembling, and you have to be wearing your finest. And if you move a limb the wrong way, you know, the Gemara says, someone who goes, and he, if he, you, know, you, you make a wrong motion in front of the king, you're chayiv misi, you can be executed for that. That's when you're in the king's palace. But when the king comes into the field, you're working. It's your field. You want to go over and say hi to the king? You can go over. You don't have to. You can stay working if you want. The king isn't imposing himself upon you. But the king is making himself available to you. El and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, both of them are the gili of Yud Gimel Midasar Nachman. The difference is, in, the, in, in, in on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there's all this, this solemn, solemnity, how do you say it? Solemnity, the, it's somber. Solemnity. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're in the king's palace, and we don't work, and we're all shivering and shaking. And during the month of Elul, it's our choice. It's our choice. The king is in the field. He isn't even wearing his royal clothing. Because that the royal clothing also would scare you. Imagine seeing the king in his whole regalia. He's not wearing his royal clothing. But the opportunity exists for you to go and to see the king. But you have to make the first step. Ani l'doidi v'doidi li. Ani l'doidi. The first step has to be ani l'doidi. I have to make a move towards doidi, towards my beloved, towards Hashem. And then on Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we have back the v'doidi li. But Elul is the month, yes, the Yud Gil Midat Sarachman are absolutely, they are available. But the key word over here is available. So we have to realize that there's a very, very special month ahead of us, the month of Elul, which is a month when Yud Gil Midat Sarachman is revealed, but at the same time is not imposing itself upon us. As we know, in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we all feel scared. And Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we all feel, you know, uh, we're trembling and we feel the, the seriousness of the day. Hayoim haras oilam, right? Hayoim haras oilam means that today is the birthday of the world, but the word haras can also mean the day the world trembles. It's the day the world trembles. And El, nothing's trembling. But the opportunity exists in El. It's a month of incredible gilui of the Yudyom Yudasar Rachman, and the opportunity exists if you go out towards Hashem. 
you make that first step, then Hashem is makabal you besever upon him yafis, and you taka have the gilu of yudkim of the sarachim during the month of Elul, and obviously then Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is a meaningful time. So everything that we've learned about over here in this Perik, about the Hamaka Sadas, and about these Boininos, we have to realize the month of El is upon us and it's a time to act upon it. And if and when we do that, we have to know that the Abishter is available to every single one of us and smiling at us and waiting for us to approach him during this month of El. But the key is that we have to approach him and it has to be, and it has to be real. We speak about Shuva being, Shuva being, we're reaching the essence of Hashem. Hashem's Ratzayim, the Keser, the Yudgim and the Sarachim. How do we reach there? So during Aseris and Yitzhuva, we talk about Shir HaMalois, Mimamakim Kerasicha Hashem. Talk about the way the difference between the way Chassidus understands something and the way we, without Chassidus. So normally we say it, and we're tearful, we say, Shir HaMalois, Mimamakim, from the depths, I call out to you, Hashem. I'm in a horrible, terrible place. I'm in the depths of, uh, of, of blood and of dirt and of the terrible. I call out from you, Hashem, and I say, Hashem, please pull me out of here, right? That's how we, most people understand. Hashem comes along, sits and says, no, no, no. From the depths of my being, the purest, holiest, deepest part of who I am. That's where I'm calling out to you from. Because Shuva is the idea of accessing the Oymek. The depths of everything. And when we call out to Hashem, when we do, when we do tshuva from our mimamakim, from our depths, then we reach the oimik of Hashem, which is the Yudgim Mil Sarachim. Now, the Rebbe gives a muscle in, in the Kutia Teira. He says, Imagine if you have um, a stream and it goes dry. So, what do you do? You dig. You dig deeper and you dig deeper until, the wa- until, and, until you get water that comes and once you reach the water, you hit the water, the water comes gushing and rushing. When you do tshuva, you have to dig. We have to dig deep within ourselves and that automatically causes a corresponding response by Hashem deep within Hashem, the Yudgil the Sarachmim and that causes the fresh flow of energy of Elokus that fills all the worlds and fills up all the Pekamim and causes everything to be fixed. And that is really what Shuvah is all about. Shuvah is about reaching deep, deep, deep inside of who we are. There's a sikha from the Rebbe. I don't recall whether we discussed it before. After how many years are we doing this? Five years? Six years? So I don't remember everything you've spoken about. But hopefully neither do you, so we're good. <laughs> I already remember. <laughs> He's too humble. He stays quiet. He won't hear members. <laughs> so whenever I talk about this, I always, I always um, preface it with a, a little uh, anecdote that happened with me a few years back. You know, sometimes something happens and something clicks within you. So it was one night. It was in the winter, and I was sitting in the living room of my house. And my wife was there also. I was sitting on the couch, and she was sitting on the other couch. And I suddenly thought to myself, my wife, probably, she would enjoy a cup of tea just about right now. Look at her, yeah. She could probably, uh, she'd probably enjoy it. So I got up from my seat and I'm going to go to the kitchen. I'm going to make her a cup of tea. And she sees me walking out of the room and she says, Naftali, I'm like, yeah. She says, you're going to the kitchen, do me a favor, can you make me a cup of tea? I made the cup of tea. I brought it to her, but I totally lost my, uh, <laughs> my excitement, my enthusiasm. But why? I wanted her to have the cup of tea. She had the cup of tea. Before was lifting, the shirt said in. Uh, what was the issue? The issue was, I didn't want to be told to do it. Why? Because when you're told to do something... Yeah, it's not really me who's doing it. Think about it. When you tell me to do something, especially if I have to, because when your wife tells you to bring her a cup of tea, you don't have much of a choice, right? So it's me reacting to you as opposed to me expressing a more truer and deeper part of me, which is what I wanted at that moment. 
Mitzvah Yeah. If we had more time, we could talk about the Gadol Mitzvah That's uh, That's an opposite uh, perspective, which is not a contradiction. It's just a different, uh, different angle, a different aspect. There's an interesting discussion about whether or not shuva is a mitzvah. Because the wording of the Rambam is a little vague about this. And actually, if you look at the wording of the Rambam, his words are that when, the, when there's a person, when a person does shuva, the mitzvah is to do vidui. It almost makes it sound like the tshuva itself isn't the mitzvah. The mitzvah is that if and when you decide to do tshuva, that you should, uh, you have to say vidu, you have to articulate your regret. Yeah. So there's a discussion about this, and there are different opinions, and there are some opinions that the fairy should is a mitzvah, and they explain the words of the Rambam in different ways. But the Minchas Chinuch, fascinatingly, the Minchas Chinuch is of the opinion that according to the Rambam, Shuva is not a commandment. Vidu is a commandment. If and when you decide to do tshuva, so for example, according to Minchas Chinuch, if you'd go to your Rav and say to the Rav, Rav, I ate a ham sandwich yesterday. What should I do? So if the Rav is passing according to the Rambam, the Rav will tell you, don't, well, you, what's your question? You want to know if you can do it again? No, you can't do it again. Allah <laughs> doesn't allow that, right? But do I have to do anything about what I did? So the Rav will say, there is no obligation. No. But if you do decide to do tshuva, then halacha does tell you how to do it. And it has to involve vidui. That is a mitzvah. This is like many other mitzvahs in the Torah which are contingent. In other words, if you decide you want to wear a garment that has four corners, then you have to fix tzitzis there. But there's no chiyuv to wear tzitzis. If you want to eat meat, you have to shecht it. It's no chiyuv to eat meat. If you want to do tshuva, Torah prescribes the way how to do it. But it itself is not a commandment. It's not a mitzvah chiyuvis. It's not an obligation. Sounds surprising, right? To be clear, there is an obligation not to do the Aveira again. But that's not a distinct mitzvah. That is because there's a mitzvah not to eat treif. So that, well, yesterday I transgressed that mitzvah, but that mitzvah still applies today. So if you go to Rav, the Rav will say, obviously you have to do all the mitzvahs from here on. You can't do any averis. But do you have any obligation vis-a-vis -vis that which you did yesterday? Again, the Minchas Chinuch's understanding of the Rambam is that no. And the Rebbe explains the Shita, the opinion of the Minchas Chinuch, and he says, if you understand what shuva is, then you understand that on a certain level it can't be a commandment. Shuva is the most essential choice that a person makes. It's the mimamakim. It's from the core of our being. We turn to Hashem and say, Hashem, I don't want that. I don't want that life. I want to connect to you. And on that level of a person's being, you can't be commanded. It either is or it isn't. Either you feel it or you don't feel it. It's like the tea. It's like the tea. The mush with the tea. It's like the muscle with the tea. Right. If you're doing tshuva because Hashem told you to do tshuva, you're missing the point. Because tshuva is not about what Hashem wants. Tshuva is about identifying the deepest part of you and realizing that this is what you want. Not about following an order. And when you reach that mimamakim within yourself, the response is the gili of yud gil the sarachim from above, the essence, the core of Hashem. And then you reach that place where you and Hashem are so united and so connected at the core and at the essence, where nothing that you did mattered anymore. Because it's an essential attachment, an essential connection which you have just uncovered, an essential connection which you have just accessed.
think about this for a second. We, we say b'makim she b'alat shuvah aim them in tzaddik min gemurim yichelam lamed the mile of b'alat shuvah. What is a greater expression of a yid, a tzaddik or a b'alat shuvah? A tzaddik who did tayr, learned Torah all his life, he did mitzvahs all his life. That's beautiful. That's amazing, and that's what Hashem wants. Let's be very clear about that. But that's not a chiddush. You know what? The, you know what a chiddush is? A chiddush is a yid who decided to abandon Hashem. What? Decided to abandon Hashem. Decided Torah and mitzvahs aren't for him because he's not listening. He's not interested in listening to Hashem anymore. This yid decided. Hashem, I understand that you have, a, you, have certain, you have certain expectations of me. You want certain things of me. But you know what? I, want, I have a different agenda for myself. You have one agenda for me. You have one plan for me. You would like me to do A, B, and C, but I want to do D, E, and F. So we're going to part ways. Not because I have anything against you. You're great. You're unbelievable. But uh, I want to do what I want to do. Instead of living my life like a tzaddik, a tzaddik is someone who lives their life doing what Hashem wants them to do. I've made a life choice that I want to do what I want to do. So the person throws off Torah and throws off mitzvahs to one degree or to another. Okay, I'm not talking about, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who became fry to, to a certain degree. We can say this about all of us. And then at a certain point, You come to the realization. One second. That's not what I want. Do you want to know what I want? I want A, B, and C. <laughs> I want to connect to Hashem. I want to learn Torah. I want to do mitzvahs. I experimented and I tried everything out there. And at the very deepest place of who I am, I felt empty. That's not who I am. Because in the very deepest place of where I am and who I am, I need a connection to Hashem and I am connected to Hashem. And therefore, like uh, this person does tshuva. That is the ultimate expression of a yid. That no matter how far you go, the, at the core, you're still connected to Hashem and that core will come to light one day through tshuva. Even if a person does a to Yisrael, you can, you can make an argument that you need the Chata to a certain extent in order to bring out what the Yisrael is. To bring out what the Yid is. So you mentioned earlier, our whole lives are doing Shuvah. Absolutely. Absolutely. The reason why, the Atreve says this numerous times, the reason why we were put down here in this world is to do Shuvah. If the purpose was Tzadikim, so first of all, then Hashem made some gross miscalculation because most of us are not tzaddikim. So the purpose is that we should be tzaddikim. Something went very wrong with the plan. But besides for that, if the purpose was that we should be perfect, Hashem could have kept us in Gan Eden. We would have been tzaddikim over there. What do you need this world for? What do you need this world for, Bacha? But why did the Abishra put us down there? In the words of the Alter Rebbe, because the tzaddik has the Ava for Hashem, Bacha, Levavcha, Bacha, Nachacha. But to reach the ultimate level of love, the love of Bacha, Ma'idcha, a love which is bleak vol, a love which comes from the very essence and depth of the neshama. To be a balchuva, that's what Hashem put us down here into this world for. To be a balchuva, and you can't be commanded. So the Alter Rebbe does give us certain hamakas adat, certain isbaininus, and certain contemplations that we can contemplate, which will hopefully reveal and bring out and evoke that part of us. But Shuvah is not about creating something new. Shuvah is about reaching down deep, finding that connection, finding that attachment, finding the Pintal Yid. And when you do that, then you reach the Koitzi Shal Yud. You reach the Yud Gimbin Tzarachim, the essence of Hashem. And that's the ultimate union that there is, which is, climax is obviously on the, on the Yom Tov of Yom Kippur. Have a good Shabbos, everyone. Thank you. And, uh, Good Achanas to the month of El, beginning of El, and we'll continue. Mr. Shem.